welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hi everyone, I'm Sarthak and I welcome you to All Things Policy. For today's episode, I'm joined by my colleague Shri Krishna and we have two guests, Mr. Surya Prakash and Mr. Jatin Christopher. Jatin is a partner at JCSS Bangalore. JCSS is an accounting and regulatory services firm. Surya is program director at Daksh. Daksh is a civil society organization that has been working on law and justice system reforms. And Daksh undertakes research activities to promote accountability, better governance in India. What is interesting is... Both Jatin and Surya have been active members of a special kind of a coalition, the GSTAT coalition, Goods and Service Taxes Appellate Tribunal Coalition. In fact, Daksh convened the coalition. The coalition brought together experts from various domains and it has been advocating for the speedy constitution of a Goods and Service Tax uh, Appellate Tribunal. In this episode, we'll discuss the need for such a body and the institutional design principles that should be kept in mind while constituting such a body so that the intended objectives can be achieved. Hi, Surya. Hi, Jatin. Hi, Shri. Welcome to All Things Policy. Hi. Hi, Sarchat. Yeah. So before we start, I just, uh, we just, I just wanted to get an idea about the need for such a body, such a tribunal. Right. So in your report, uh, the keynote that you have come up with, So there you have mentioned that tax disputes uh, need to be solved fast economically without compromising the revenue interest. So what is the problem right now? How bad is the situation? Why do we need to have such a tribunal? Jatin, can you take this? Sure. See, when we look at uh, tax as in any law for that matter, there can't be one authority who implements the law and is the final arbiter of any differences of opinion. Just as uh, revenue has the responsibility to canvas the most accurate interpretation of the law, the taxpayer too has the right to interpret the law that he sees fit to the facts of his case. So it's inevitable that there will be divergence of views leading to disputes and there must be a forum of appellate redressal. Because after all, the two sides have put forward their views and therefore it can't be that one one of them becomes the deciding authority. And the tribunal for a long time has played a very stellar role, especially in matters involving certain specialized understanding of that domain. And tax has been no stranger to this. GST will require redressal by an independent appellate tribunal so that it sits up there above the executive so that it can uh, look at both sides and based on the principles in the law, come out with a final finding on facts. So I have a rookie question actually. So what is the current situation like? Because we know GST came into force in 2017 and it's been uh, nearly six years now and I'm sure there are a lot of disputes and litigations which have arisen except there is no appellate uh, body which is handing out rulings, right? So what is the current situation like? See, currently... The tribunal could not be formed due to challenges in the structure of the tribunal as contained in the statute. Courts have uh, struck down some of those provisions that were violating certain first principles. I mean, first principles not to complicate it. Whenever there is a judicial body, it needs to be comprised of judicial members or at least the majority of them should be judicial members. Presently, As the law stands, the majority of technical members are to constitute the tribunal bench. And that's the part that Supreme Court has uh, objected to. So where we stand today, we don't have a tribunal. High courts of each state have to shoulder this burden. It's just a temporary arrangement. But government is trying to get all the ducks in a row to get this tribunal going as quickly as possible. So, Jatin, what has been the impact of this on, let's say, the economy, the business businesses? Given that you don't have a tribunal right now, you don't have a appropriate dispute resolution mechanism. Right. See, tribunal is a, a far more readily approachable forum, unlike a high court. High court looks at, uh, entertains 
appeals, statutory appeals through the writ petition route presently. So therefore, high courts have uh, points of reference that a high court will consider are fairly limited. And since appeals on uh, that, that should have gone to the tribunal involve questions of facts, high courts can't be burdened with getting into facts. So today, the challenge we all face is that there are matters ripe to be redressed by a tribunal, but we're having to only in exceptional cases approach the high court where questions of law is involved, but all other cases are pending. In fact, the government has issued a circular stating that the limitation to file appeals before the tribunal will only commence once the president of the tribunal assumes office. So in that sense, we're all waiting. We need answers. We don't have answers. And consequently, lower functionaries in the tax office are continuing to canvas their interpretation without a redress from the tribunal. I think this is also one of the reasons why India's performance when it comes to ease of doing business and all these things is quite low, right? You have so many of these disputes and the disputes can't be settled in a time-bound manner. And this can act as a disincentive for firms to participate in the economy. So if I may take that point, uh, uh, Sarthak, yes, it is uh, definitely a case. What has held up the setting up of the tribunal for GST, which is much needed, like how Jati pointed out, are legal challenges because the original conception of it did not meet the thresholds of uh, independence and uh, other things that the previous jurisprudence had laid down on the, on this topic. Also, I think from a policy change management perspective, you want the the field manage the field level staff itself they themselves were still coming into terms with coming to terms with what the law was with implementing with administering it also bear in mind that there is a center and the state level field staff are working to administer this as uniformly as possible so it made some sense to defer the resolution of the uh, dispute resolution because maybe it will settle down. The administration itself will figure out how to do things in uh, a more coordinated manner and uh, in a more harmonious way. If you already provide a button to escalate matters, maybe it would have been a more it would have introduced more friction in the adoption. Um, so thought about it from a policy rollout. I think it makes sense, but I am aware that there are also jurisprudential issues that have come in the way. So, uh, moving ahead a little, so if we are to constitute a tribunal today uh, for handling all the GST cases, what would the ideal setup look like? So, if we are to establish a well-functioning um, GSTAT, right. how can we design it in a way that, you know, it is replicable, it is resilient and can also uh, not be jammed by delays as we have seen in many other cases. Uh, so, what are some of the design principles that we need to keep in mind while now? Uh, going ahead and set GSTAD. So this is where, uh, this is why Daksh is, uh, was so, is so excited about this opportunity, that you are getting a once in a lifetime opportunity to design an institution of global standards. It can be a huge signal to the world that, you know, India is serious about building institutions for the future. GST itself is a radical transformation of the indirect access uh, system. Um, so an uh, appellate tribunal uh, should live up, it should continue in that same trajectory. So the GST and the GST network, the technology backbone that is driving GST has already uh, made a lot of progress in making transactions compliance and other things completely online, digital. We should not let the ball drop. We, at the coalition, once, you know, we all came together with this idea that let us make sure that, let us advocate for a GST appellate tribunal that will meet the aspirations of the future. The few guiding principles that we have gone by in our note that was released in November and we have been sharing with policyholders across, policymakers across, is um, it should be citizen centric. You need to keep the citizen in mind, in focus while designing the institution. What does that mean? It should be easily accessible, whether digitally or 
in uh, in person if you want to go which is where the court rooms will be located tribunals will be located it should be easily accessible uh, it should have certainty of hearings once you go into this system once you go approach this institution there should be visibility there should be comfort and clarity on okay i'm filing a case now it will get over in 3 weeks if it's a stay matter it will reach some stage in 6 months in one year i just throwing up numbers but the fact that we should think of dispute resolution institutions as also having been ingrained in it a clarity on certainty of hearings is i think imperative for any institution of the future but it is also important that it is independent like how jatin pointed out in the beginning tax administration tax policy making is one aspect of it and this institution is going to sit in judgment as it were over many of the actions of both the administrators and the taxpayers so it, independence is a strong feature that needs to be inculcated and ingrained in the institutional design at this stage itself that will mean that there is adequate number of judicial members uh, which is anyway the uh, jurisprudential threshold for it we will come to the functional specialization of it in just a bit a lot of the discussion on the gst appellate tribunal has been on the federal nature of it now we should keep in mind that a gst appellate the gst itself and and jatin is an expert on this i'm just uh, encapsulating those ideas is a simultaneous taxation neither the center nor the state have given up their taxing rights they have pooled their taxing rights it's a simultaneous taxation now in the past tax dispute resolution was somehow under the control of these state governments and lesser so in the case of union government now this federal structure needs to be maintained but also retaining independence right so that is the real uh, friction here how do you ensure that the states and the union government who are giving up who are pulling together the tax rights and are giving up their tax dispute resolution powers in a sense are both kept at an arm's length but also involved in the design and working of the institution few challenges a big other feature is harmonizing jurisprudence and jatin please add if i miss something here this is more on the substantive side our experience in the past has shown that divergent views of dispute resolution bodies have hampered the tax compliance has added cost to the business and has made life difficult throughout now gst was envisaged as one nation one tax i mean you can debate that idea itself but when you're going towards working towards a vision of making it easy for citizens to comply and making it easy for businesses to go on with their businesses then the dispute resolution institution should also be oriented towards that vision yes independence yes separation of powers yes judicial uh, thinking needs to be brought in but can we avoid these divergent views at each state level how do we ensure that the jurisprudence that evolves is harmonious and serves this um, ease of doing business or one nation one tax vision whichever way you want to look at and this is my last part and i'll throw it open for further comments from nathan is is the functional specialization something that we are very keen to advocate in this opportunity is there is certain amount of can i say apprehension that earlier we used to handle the dispute resolution also whether it was right or wrong of course it was lesser so in the union stage because the sestat or the segat was which is the erstwhile indirect tax uh, bodies were removed from the union government but we need to make sure that the gst appellate tribunal has the right amount of administrative support to make it as independent as possible which will include you having a cto good hr person so that you know engagement with the technology engagement with the personnel is robust a good finance person because many times tribunals have suffered from lack of funds 
right? And here you're talking about meeting the needs of the expectations and the aspirations of both the state and the union government. So how can we think of the GST-80 as having a strong administrative cadre and an administrative structure? You can really stretch your imagination and say, if the GSTN, which is the technology backbone of GST for the entire country, is a special purpose vehicle, which is meeting the needs of the country, then can the GST-80 also have an SPV to meet its administrative needs? It's a slightly, you know, far out idea, but no harm in thinking about those, you know, possibilities. And once you have the GST-80 also structured this way, then, you know, other tribunals can also benefit from such a structure, and that is what excites us at this stage. I know I've spoken for quite a bit, so I'm just going to take my breath and allow yeah. others to come in. Yeah, so, yeah, so in fact, uh, before we move forward, we have a quick break. I have some questions, and once we are back, we can go ahead yeah, with go the on. conversation. Yeah. Welcome from the break. So Surya was explaining about some of the design principles before the break. I have some questions here. So Surya, you talked about independence, right? Now, what have you in mind when it comes to ensuring that this tribunal is independent, right? What are some of the things that needs to be done? Again, Jatin, you can also take the question. Apart from that, another thing, I was going through the report. So there are different kinds of things related to transparency and all those things, right? So how do you ensure that transparency? One point was that voluntary publishing should be there. So how do you ensure all these things? What are the accountability mechanisms over there? So maybe I can take the second one. It's easier. So the way usually accountability is brought in to the dispute resolution institutions is to make it more transparent uh, so that the public can periodically hold them accountable by looking at the data, by evaluating its performance. Here, the courts and tribunals really need to increase the way. While we always think of judgments as being public documents and therefore it is completely transparent, um, a lot of the intermediate steps, right from the filing to what happens at each hearing, these are um, data that can be put out and tribunals can learn from the court's data structures that have made some uh, more progress than tribunals have. So ways to ensure accountability is through transparency. This can be built into the rules itself and not have to have, again, resort to RTIs, which seems to be a, a broken uh, things. You could also have other aspects of the functioning of the tribunal, more transparent, like minutes of the leadership committees, vendor agreements, having very robust consultation mechanisms uh, with stakeholders inbuilt into the rules. On the independence part of it, maybe I should ask uh, uh, Jatin to come in here. Right. When you look at this aspect, you know, in addition to all those good points that Surya mentioned, the fact that proceedings are in a public forum, it's an open court, itself has enormous amount of you know, circumspection that the tribunal members will have to consider before they, the way they conduct uh, business in court. Starting from filing to entire proceedings and finally what becomes of the dispute of the parties, we've got nothing to hide. Make it public right from the get-go. Let everyone get to see. You see what's happening and we've got a good flavor of uh, how court proceedings go, go about. We've seen uh, YouTube channels where various courts have made their proceedings live. And if you I'm sure everyone's had a chance to spend some time viewing some of those channels and you'll find the process of how the judge gets from the facts to the decision. You'll find that it's completely transparent. And speaking about tribunals, the same features will exist in the tribunal. The aspects that we will need to ensure that helps bring this transparency. I can just call out two so we can jump in and add more. One is that presently the first appellate authority is an executive officer with this role. For example, if the joint commissioner appeals were to hear appeals for the at the first instance, he will spend a year or two and then get back into an executive role. Tribunal members should not be getting back to the respective departments. They should superannuate out of the tribunal themselves. That will bring in some amount of... Uh, uh, transparency and independence as to how they function. The second is that the tribunal bench itself should be dominated by judicial members for the reason 
it's not just uh, looking at the rules looking at the facts doing the math arriving at the tax liability that today the system is able to do but what is required is to bring one's wisdom about first principles of law to bear on the facts of a particular case because uh, you know principles in law are well established as to how one should go about taking any executive action and uh, if we bring this into the institutional design itself then it's not necessary that uh, taxpayer and the tax administrator must always agree on everything all the time and that would be the day when we can say we've achieved ease of doing business the fact that there is an independent tribunal who will be the arbiter of this dispute is reason enough for the two to conduct themselves in the most expeditious manner i think that would be the day So I had a couple of comments and questions to both of you. So I'm completely with you when you talk of independence, right? Of course, tribunals need to be immunized from any interference by the executive. In that sense, they need to be independent. And also, I'm with you when you speak of citizen-centric approach. Uh, it's a no-brainer that we need to have a digital system backed by state-of-the-art technology to make it, uh, you know, like a model tribunal, as you pointed out earlier, Surya. And on the federal character, I think we can park it for later because I think uh, that's where most of the dispute about dispute resolution is right so my question to you is on uh, harmonizing jurisprudence bit where uh, you spoke about how divergent views by smaller benches may not necessarily be good or benches within a state may not necessarily be good for the overall tax or uh, gst regime uh, so i want to understand uh, that you know a lay person's view is that uh, differing judicial opinions are not necessarily a bad thing they bring in diversity of thought and opinion and it contributes towards the final jurisprudence which a higher court uh, later on lays down right but in the situation of tax why do you think that is not a great idea why do you think that can somehow uh, affect the business continuity or uh, increase the cost of compliance why is it so different and also maybe you can give us a couple of illustrations as to why you know the differing views taken by different benches can be so problematic so when it comes to questions of facts there can be divergence of opinion because facts will vary did you supply on this date did you supply on that date did uh, what was your supply to another state or was it to this questions of facts can have divergence and it, and they won't have such an adverse bearing because facts everyone knows will vary from case to case but on interpretation of law when there is divergence because they are introducing a certain principle as to how this fact set of facts must be given this tax treatment when there is divergence there then there is a responsibility of the decision pronouncing body to provide reasons because it's these reasons that will help us distinguish between two forum where they are considering similar facts when we find issues like this come up that's when it will cause some angst among taxpayers but also we will need to bear in mind that taxpayers will express their displeasure over ants over interpretations that is not to their liking but that's exactly the reason why there is a further appeal if it is on questions of law but not on facts because tribunal is a is a final fact finding authority that is where it's important that the tribunal is able to grasp the facts domain understanding along with principle first principles on rule of law both need to bear themselves out while rendering decisions in each case right so moving on to the bit about the federal character and the current i think the log jam uh, with respect to constitution of gst at in the country so from what i understand now the section uh, 109 of the cgst act central goods and services tax act says that it essentially lays down a twin structure it says there is national tribunal which is consisting of the national bench followed by regional benches and there is going to be state tribunals which are going to be consisting of a state bench as well as area benches within a state and this is essentially a twin structure and there is a uh, a division in terms of their jurisdiction as well uh, the national tribunal is only supposed to hear cases which uh, are relating to the dispute on the place of supply right and rest of the cases will go to the state so i want to know two things i understand by going through your report that you are against uh, such a twin structure and you would rather have a unified national tribunal 
because of all the reasons that we spoke about earlier, right? So my first question is, first of all, why is there a twin structure in this act? Could you maybe tell us a bit about the history before the enactment of the law itself as to why we have this problem in the first place? And second, going on, could you just tell how having a national tribunal may not necessarily be so bad for the federal character? See, when we talk about twin structure, the twin structure is the legacy system. Central taxes have had the have had a different tribunal. State taxes have uh, had a different tribunal. So today we are dealing with experience of the past bearing itself out on how things should be going forward. It's because states and the union have experience of having constituted a tribunal, run it whatever way they have run it. Somehow there is a proclivity to think that, all right, let's deal with GST also. But the challenge with GST is it's not that it's very similar to the past. It's a very different legislation. Whoever constitutes and establishes and runs the tribunal will need to bear in mind that, like Surya was mentioning, it's a simultaneous statute that's being administered. A given transaction attracts incidents under two legislations. So when anyone is administering it, they're simultaneously passing orders under both the legislations. So therefore, interpretations, time-tested principles relating to some of the concepts like input tax credit, valuation, deemed supply, deemed valuation, etc., which HSN code, etc., that we use in GST, someone needs to bring that deep understanding of those principles into GST. So the challenge is, can states do it? Is center better off at doing it, etc.? But it's not to say that either is better off at either will be better off in handling the tribunal, but there are inherent structural challenges that make it difficult for states to run with this. And there are challenges that even center will have to deal with. Before I know Surya help, we'll have some thoughts about this and it's important for us to hear his thoughts on this. I'll just add here one aspect that uh, to say that National bench and its regional benches will only address matters relating to place of supply is not entirely accurate because uh, the provisions as they stand today say that, among other things, if place of supply is also in dispute, then the whole of that dispute will be carried to the national or the regional bench. And if disputes involve many things, but place of supply is not one of them, then regardless of their value and sensitivity, it will go to the state benches. So in that sense, it's not like the state has a secondary role to play. It has a perhaps a coextensive role with the national and regional benches, except that since a third state's interests will be at stake, that the national and regional benches are interested to address place of supply issues, but otherwise they will function in terms of competence and the binding nature of their decisions, it would be coextensive. So just quickly to add one point here is the place of supply rules, like how Jatin pointed out, if it is one of the disputes, so in the current dual structure, if place of supply rules is one of the dispute, it goes to the national bench and they have a view. Now, uh, state level tribunals are independent institutions, right? We have to remember that these tribunals will not, should not be attached to the parent department in any way. They will be headed by a retired High Court judge or a Supreme Court judge, and they will have their own rules, they will have their own binding precedents. So, a uh, Tamil Nadu GST tribunal will not have any binding precedents over a Maharashtra uh, GST tribunal if it were to come into place. So, what will happen is where place of supply rules is not a concern, you will have differing views from these two tribunals. Right. Now, the advantage of a national tribunal is that you will the benches will still have an opportunity to have a differing view if they if the differing view is indeed warranted but a binding precedence is created and say okay we are all part of a same national tribunal so if a bombay bench has given a view on this matter i will have to give reasons as to why i am differing from the bombay bench which is not required uh, if it is two different institutions. That is why a national tribunal will help in harmonization while still allowing for uh, divergent views to come up wherever they want. Yeah, uh, so thanks Surya for this. Uh, thanks Jatin. Now, I was thinking of it from another angle, like 
the political economy part of it so when the gst came into being right at that point of time also there were many states which were opposing gst and in the last few years what we have seen is uh, again there has been issues between the union and the states like be it gst compensation and recently uh, the states were saying that okay they would need a greater share of gst right that 50 50 thing is not working and also whatever revenue expectations were there from the state that okay, if gst is there they will they will get this much amount of revenue but that has also not happened right so in this context now again when you are suggesting that we should have a national tribunal instead of the state benches again the states will be losing out on some power maybe so if you look at that political economy angle right how can you how can the union convince the states to get on board with this proposal or uh, will there be and do you see there will be some sort of a compromise give and take how do you see that so without raising the crystal ball i think the fact that the states should view the tribunal as giving up power even if it were at a state tribunal level or rather to put it the other way if states were to think of state level tribunals as an extension of their departments then this is not going any forward because hmm. the previous structure too was struck down and there a lot of jurisprudence that has evolved on the tribunals and which have reiterated the importance of tribunals and the need for separation from the parent departments if the same from if the same structure is repeated it will meet with legal challenges so the, from a political economy i would say that to view state level tri- for states to view state level tribunals as an extension of their power is grossly a mistake now how it will compromise how it will be going forward i don't know maybe it will be a resource question that you know it may be more efficient to run national level institution with all of this money otherwise we will be anyway gst collections are a contentious so again to spend a part of that to run an institution dispute resolution institution we seem to be a drain on the resources right. so and i, I think that, you know, that's the same point from surya what, what surya is saying i think who's going to pay the bills will get to have their way yeah <laughs> because the states have lost money since last june once the compensation stopped all this debate will finally come down to who's going to pay the bills and if that point the last person to leave the party will be the union i think <laughs> <laughs> so i had a quick question so in order to create a single national tribunal now does it require an amendment to the statute or can this be done uh, by a recommendation from the gst council what do you think see the law making process is that the council must make a recommendation and uh, parliament should uh, amend the central law and uh, states also need to make an amendment but a clever way to introduce this would be not necessarily to have this these provisions in the state legislations it could even be in one common legislation like the integrated gst law but the fact is that law will have to be amended rules will have to be made in alignment with that law and uh, the tribunal's uh, conduct the rules of procedure the entire body of work will have to be enacted to give effect to the tribunal okay it looks like a long way ahead actually no because uh, this is not something that's new it's not like as a country we have very little experience in this we know how it's to be done it's just that if the few pieces are agreed by the states the center then i think it's sort of templatized but the aspects where daksh is uh, very uh, vociferous in getting this across you know maybe surya can articulate this better things like it has to be natively technology based it has to be independent perhaps this svb piece you know i'll i request surya to jump in on this to list out what are the things that actually define what we need because it, it, it should be considered a very long drawn process because it won't be as long as the basic elements are agreed putting in place the legislation shouldn't take as much time you right the, the statutory amendments will not take long as long as there is a, a meeting of minds on how it should look like so it it is the meeting of the minds that is more contentious than the actual legislation itself so jatin do you have any closing remarks yeah i do when we look at a dispute resolution i think there will be disputes and it would be wishful thinking that the tribunals will have uh, no work to do the strong tribunal is what is going to act as a deterrent and the taxpayers are entitled to 
canvas their views and carry this forward because they owe so much confidence in justice being dispensed at the tribunal. If we keep that in mind, in GST, divergent views must exist, it will exist, but there's also going to be an explosion of litigation because of uh, the plurality of views that nearly every section is susceptible to. The extent of financial burden for taxpayers is so great that it's simply not worth conceding at the first uh, round of when disputes come up. And the third thing is that there is this assurance that uh, both sides will carry this forward saying, I'm confident about my interpretation. I need someone who's independent, who will give me a hearing and then pass a binding decision. That is what the tribunal will have to deliver in GST. Surya, do you have any final (laughs) remarks? So this is a great opportunity to build something new. I hope the policymakers don't pass up this opportunity to reimagine a dispute resolution institution that is resilient and built for the future. It can also make a huge impact on ease of doing business and signal to the world India's leadership in this space. So I'm very hopeful that uh, we have a more uh, enlightened discourse going out. A lot of work ahead, but I'm hopeful. Yeah, thanks, Surya. Thanks, Jatin, for giving us insights into how an effective GSTAT should look like. And along with this podcast, we will be sharing the link of the report that you have all prepared together as a collision. Thanks to the listeners for joining us. We'll meet again in another episode of All Things Policy. Thank you, Shantan. Thank you, Sri. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashila.inst or our website takshashila.org.in.